Welcome back everybody to another Sabaton history reaction video. This is one I thought I had already done, but I guess I didn't. I went back and looked at the list and saw that I haven't reacted to the history video for uh, The Last Stand, which is about the sack of Rome in 1527 by soldiers under Charles V, who was a Holy Roman Emperor. These were actually Protestant soldiers who kind of were mutinying because they hadn't uh, received their proper pay and things like that. Uh, so I thought we'd dive into this one today. And as always, make sure you hit the uh, like button, hit that subscribe button. In fact, don't do anything else. Don't watch any more of the video until you subscribe. I'd appreciate that very much. Thank you. Uh, we're going to be adding some more historical site content video as well as continued reactions in the weeks and months ahead. This way you won't miss any of it. So let's dive into Sabaton History's The Last Stand. I'm Indy Nidell. And I'm Pat Leinhardt. And I'm here to talk about the Crusades. They were so exciting times. And uh, I can't imagine the last stand in the Crusader times. All right. So <laughs> my understanding is a lot of people have thought this song was about the Crusades, which is not 1527. is hundreds of years after the last Crusade. Uh, so uh, it's kind of funny that they're choosing to go that route. Because I've even seen uh, fan-made videos for that song, The Last Stand, in which they use clips from the movie Kingdom of Heaven, which is about the Crusades. So that's kind of funny. It Crusade. was like so damn cool to be a Crusader at that time. Crusades, they are the most important thing in Sabaton life. Crusaders, Crusades, all of that Crusades. Crusades. And more Crusades. Crusades. We, we're going to do more Crusades. Crusades. <laughs> hey, did you know that the Knights of the Templar Order might have founded Switzerland? When Pope Clement V declared in the early 1300s that all Templar knights were heretics and should be killed, many of them fled France, taking their huge treasury with them. The Templars, shrewd bankers, may have brought their treasure and their military expertise to a loose confederation of poor farmers just over the French border. Well, okay, that may actually be just a myth. But what if it was true, right? I mean, I mean, look at the Swiss flag. Quite similar to the Templar's cross if you swap the colors, right? Just saying. Anyhow, I will get back to factual history now. Over 200 years later, too. Rome, November 1523. The whole Vatican seemed like, like one big building site, trying to reinvent itself with classical palaces and basilicas. The city was quite cosmopolitan, where pilgrims and travelers mingled with people from all over Europe. But the mood just now was tense. Hushed voices spoke of the ongoing deadlock within the conclave of cardinals, trying to choose a new pope. Busy feet shuffled under the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, where Michelangelo's new ceiling frescoes barely got any attention. So focused was everyone on the decision at hand. And we have to say this about the Catholic Church. I don't want to say the Catholic Church as a whole, specifically the papacy. Uh, for a good part of... Uh, Roman history, the Pope was very much not just a religious leader. He was a political leader. The papal states were their own kind of entity. Uh, the Pope very often was a military leader that would go out in full armor and actually lead fights. Um, this is kind of when this is starting to wind down. This is also at the time of Martin Luther, when the Reformation has begun and when the, um, the Protestants are starting to uh, make a name for themselves. People like Martin Luther who have broken away. And so you, you're having these uh, wars happening now between Protestants and Catholics. And, and Europe is very, very divided uh, in terms of uh, focus on religion. This is also right about the moment when Henry VIII is trying to get his divorce in England from Catherine of Aragon so he can marry um, Anne Boleyn. And he ends up breaking from the Catholic Church to form the Church of England over all of this. Several seemingly suitable cardinals were proposed, but none could win. And it looked like it would all come down to the two candidates supported by the two great powers in the European world. Okay, for centuries, Italy and the Vatican had been the real life chessboard for the ambitions of kings. By now, a new crisis was developing between Francis I of France and Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. And Charles V, by the way, who had a massive chin, by the way, um, was the nephew of Catherine of Aragon, who was the uh, soon-to-be-out wife of Henry VIII of England. Uh, so there's just one more layer to all of this. And, and England was constantly going back and forth between 
uh, allying with Francis and allying with Charles. And uh, at any given time, it just kind of depended on which one benefited them more. Charles was pretty much the most powerful ruler in Europe since the days of Charlemagne 700 yep. years earlier. And that certainly went to his head. He saw himself not only as divinely appointed ruler, but as the one and only Christian ruler of Europe, whose duty it was to dominate France and then unite Christendom under his banner. Giulio de' Medici was the papal candidate Charles supported. And on November 16th, he was elected and became Pope Clement VII. Everything seemed perfect, but as it would soon turn out, Clement VII's papacy would actually be one of the worst in history. And this is really saying something, but it began by Clement trying to be a good Pope. Pope Leo X, Clement's predecessor, had been very popular in the Italian peninsula. And for a simple reason, he behaved less like a Pope and more like an old Roman emperor. He was a lavish spender and a playboy who threw wild parties and extravagant banquets. Unlike Leo, Clement wanted to reign with scholars and clerics, with, with fasts and actual religious obligations. Surprisingly, this made him deeply unpopular with the clergy in Rome. Now, now, now this was a problem, but, but he still had the emperor on his side, right? I mean, all he had to do was not agitate his royal benefactor. And this actually is another common theme in history. You go all the way back to, again, in England, where you have people like Henry II who uh, appoint Thomas Becket to be the Archbishop of Canterbury, thinking that he's going to be an ally in the church, who, uh, which had tremendous power throughout Europe. And Becket actually takes his role seriously uh, as a religious leader, and that ticks off Henry II and leads to all kinds of trouble. Same thing kind of happens here. A guy who... Uh, is a secular leader and a guy who's a religious leader, probably the two most powerful people in Europe at that time, uh, who run into a different set of priorities. Which he promptly did. Charles was fighting a war against France in northern Italy, and rumors reached his ears that Clement had been secretly in contact with the cities of Venice and Milan to form a defensive pact with Rome in case things went bad for the Holy Roman Empire. Charles was a bit irritated by that backdoor dealing, but okay, fair enough, you know, plans for the future, right? Okay, he understood. But when secret peace negotiations between Clement and France were suddenly not so secret anymore, Charles was furious. This, this was outright treason, fuming with anger. He even proclaimed that this, this Martin Luther guy in all the news actually might have had a point with his <laughs> hatred for the papacy. And so Martin Luther's kind of the go-to guy if you're upset with the Pope, right? Um, and it's amazing how quickly allegiances can change. He goes from supporting the Pope, supporting the Catholic Church, being this great defender of the faith, Charles V, who's Spanish, but also is the Holy Roman Empire, so he controls Spain, but also most of what is now Germany. Um, he suddenly finds himself turning to Martin Luther, who's German, who's living in the Holy Roman Empire, uh, it's it's much like, again, what Henry VIII did. Henry VIII uh, wrote scathing things about Martin Luther, was called the defender of the faith by a previous pope. And then here he is a few years later breaking away from the Catholic Church. It all depended on what your priorities were at any given time. Remember, we are right at the beginning of the Reformation, and Luther had only been condemned as an outlaw by Charles two years ago. Okay. After the decisive Battle of Pavia in 1525, where the French received a complete mauling by the imperial forces, with Francis even being captured, Charles gave his commander in Italy, Constable Bourbon, another task. With 5,000 Spanish troops, he should go south and have a little chat with the Pope. But Georg von Schunsberg, the famous German military commander, would rather see Clement hanged for his treachery, and he himself raised over 10,000 German Landsknechte out of his own pocket. And while the Spaniards were relatively disciplined, the Landsknechte were emphatically not. Soldiers for hire, loyal only to their pay, and many won over by Martin Luther's words, they were all too eager to get their hands on the wealth of the Catholic Church. In early 1527, Bourbon's 5,000 Spanish and Frunsberg's 10,000 Germans linked up with other mercenaries eager for loot. But then Frunsberg suffered a stroke and returned north. Now Bourbon, 
stranded in Italy and trying to control both companies for which he didn't really have the money was left with only one option, move swiftly forward and loot Rome. So by May the 5th, around 20,000 Imperials were knocking on Rome's front door, the Spirito Gate. Bourbon himself, wearing a bright white cloak over his armor, ordered his troops to build ladders and scale the walls. They were fired upon by arquebusiers and light artillery and took heavy losses. See, fortified cities could not be easily stormed at the time, not without heavy artillery, and Bourbon's army had none. And while the garrison of Rome defended its walls, Pope Clement could still rely on the elite soldiers of the Italian Black Bands and his personal protectors, the 189-man-strong Swiss Guard. And the Swiss Guard, I don't know if you'll talk about this, we talked about this during the reaction to the Last Stand song. Uh, Swiss Guard were not unique to Rome, and this is something I, I didn't know for a long time. I learned this uh, only in the last couple of years. Uh, you know, when I think of the Swiss Guard, I think even today of the, the men who guard uh, the Vatican, uh, and our guards to the Pope. And uh, the Swiss Guard actually were hired to guard many of the royal families in Europe. They were not unique just to the Pope. But this is, again, this is an example of his status as more than just a religious leader because the Swiss Guard guarded royal families. And so he is a royal leader. He's, he's a political leader as well as a religious one. Swiss mercenaries were extraordinarily good soldiers and highly valued all across Europe. But while the defenders were busy pouring boiling liquid onto the massive attackers, a dense fog suddenly fell. It became so thick that the men could barely see each other. And the defenders on the walls were, were firing blindly, realizing his chance. Bourbon ran forward, holding one of the ladders himself and urging his troops onward. But he was hit and killed instantly. News of his death spread rapidly, and the initial confusion in the ranks of the attackers turned into a lust for revenge for killing their leader, and more importantly, their paymaster. Yeah, so here's the thing. Now, both leaders of these two groups, remember he, he said there was one group of 5,000 that was under Bourbon, and then the other group of 10,000. The group of 10,000, mostly Protestants, their leader had already gone back to Germany. And now this, uh, the leader of the overall command is also gone. So yeah, pay is a big part of this. And this is why they're going to go forward into areas they're not supposed to go in. And just while I'm thinking about it, I haven't said this sooner, but can we just talk about what a great storyteller Indy Nidell is when it comes to how he communicates these things? I love listening to him. I love the way he shares these stories. Uh, I could just watch him all day, and I'm actually going to be uh, doing some reactions to his other channel that he's a part of. Uh, I think he has one about World War One that I definitely want to dive into more. So let's continue. The Imperials surged forward, and their numbers overwhelmed the defenders. With the gates then thrown open for the rest of the Imperials, the defense of Rome collapsed. The invaders swarmed over the city. And with Bourbon dead, there was, there was no authority to even try to restrain them, if that was even possible by this point. The black bands were routed, while the Swiss Guard gathered at the obelisk in front of St. Peter's, readying themselves for a last stand near the Teutonic Cemetery. It was their duty to fight and die for the Pope's safety. And so they did. Armed with halberds and swords in their hands and faith in their hearts, they waited for the final battle on the steps of St. Peter's. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith. Not that much is known about the actual fighting. Heavily outnumbered, they stood true to their vows and formed a defensive wall of halberds in front of St. Peter's. In a fight they could not hope to win, the men of the Swiss Guard were gradually overwhelmed and slaughtered. Still, their sacrifice gave the Pope enough time to escape through a secret passage. Accompanied by 42 survivors of the 189, they ran... So that's an important point, too, because I've had a number of people tell me uh, in the re other reaction that the 42 were different than the 189, that there was the 189 out here and the 42 over here. And my understanding was, and it seems to be confirmed by what he said here, that those 42 are the survivors of the original 189. So these are still Swiss Guard. These are just the ones that survived that initial fight. And now they're going to help uh, defend the Pope as he makes his way uh, through a secret passage to Castel San Angelo. 
ran across the Passetto di Borgo up to the Castel Sant'Angelo. More and more of the guard died along the way, fending off the pursuing Imperials. The last few still standing made it into the Castello with the Pope, and then they could fire heavy artillery and falconets into the mass of attackers, preventing the Castello from being overwhelmed. The Pope and those closest to him were safe thanks to the sacrifice of the Swiss Guard. But a horrible massacre was unfolding down below as the Imperials, the mercenaries, made their way through the city. No one was spared their wrath, not women, not children, not the clergy, nor the holy sites. Monks and priests were brutally killed. Nuns were raped on sacred altars. People were cut, beaten, and branded. Their teeth and nails pulled out for the information about their valuables. It's... It's unfortunate. It's more than unfortunate. It's downright horrendous that that kind of stuff happens. But this is not unusual in war. Any war you read about, by and large, this happened a lot. Um, you know, these guys get their bloodlust up and they start fighting and they've been through battle and then they just kind of just take whatever. And It's just such a, a weird thing that happens. These are men that probably, by and large, would never have done these things on their own. But when they get into a mob mentality and they... And they it starts, then everybody gets into it. It's such a strange and fascinating uh, phenomena that takes place in war and, and really unfortunate that we as people are capable of such things. Sources speak of molten lead being poured down throats and severed testicles in the streets. Tombs were looted, holy relics were carried away, often by famous artists and noblemen who now served as porters for the soldiers. From high above, Pope Clement was forced to look upon the destruction that he was unable to prevent. He grew a beard as a sign of mourning. It would take until February 1528 that the last of the barbaric invaders had left Rome. What they left behind was a city in ruins, with dead by the thousands floating in the river. It would take decades for Rome to recover. The city's population was reduced by some 80 percent. Wow. And it is seen by many as the end of the Italian Renaissance. But the sack of Rome affected more than just the city. Afterwards, Clement was no longer able to oppose Charles's ambitions, and a religious power shift away from the Pope and toward the Emperor had lasting consequences for all of Europe. For example, the Pope, at Charles' direction, refused to annul the marriage of Charles' aunt, Catherine of Aragorn, to England's Henry VIII, which kicked off the English Reformation. So he said Catherine of Aragorn, and that's a common thing to do because, especially if you're a fan of Lord of the Rings, you think of Aragorn, the, the character from Lord of the Rings, is Catherine of Aragorn, but... I'll forgive that. I make 20 such slip-ups in what I say in every video that I make. So he's doing great. The split in continental Europe between Protestant and Catholic was made permanent by the sack. And Martin Luther even pointed out, Christ reigns in such a way that the emperor who persecutes Luther for the Pope is forced to destroy the Pope for Luther. Hmm. And while that's a bit general, the power of the papacy was diminished afterwards, even as the Inquisition grew under Charles's son, Philip II. The rift between Catholic and Protestant would culminate in the Thirty Years' War. About And Philip II was married to Queen Mary of England, who was Henry VIII's daughter, who we know as Bloody Mary, for her persecution of Protestants as the last Catholic uh, at least overtly Catholic uh, monarch in England before a series of Protestant ones. Which Sabaton wrote several songs on the Carolus Rex album. And as for the heroic fighting of the Swiss Guard, it would go down in history as one of the great last stands and left them with the everlasting gratitude of the papacy. And to this day, the Swiss Guard, still in their traditional garb nearly 500 years later, serves as the honor guard of the Pope. So I know a bunch of people are going to be wondering why we started this episode with Crusades, 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 <laughs> but it's not about the Crusades. No, it's a meme. It became yeah. a meme. I guess somebody misunderstood the song or too many people started misunderstanding the song. So our lovely Sabaton fans, instead of bashing them and, you know, trolling them on the internet, made memes about them instead. Now, do you have a whole bunch of memes of yours? 
Yeah, there's been a few over the years. Uh, I think this one and well, the Winged Oh yeah, I but guess. that's that's uh, see, I knew that one. I didn't know this one though. So. It's even sometimes going only in in text form. You don't even need a yeah. picture. Sometimes you are on Reddit reading about a totally different topic, and then somebody just writes, and then the Winged Hussars arrived. And people have done that to me, even even before I did a reaction to the Winged Hussars uh, video. Uh, I would get a lot of comments from those of you who are Sabaton fans who would put, and the winged Hussars arrived, which I love now that I get. It's fantastic. Keep it up. Yeah, I did. <laughs> but the, we've, we've seen that in our comments a lot uh, over over the last what eight months or so we've been doing this show, yeah. or more than that now. Um, I've, I've been fortunate enough, fortunate enough, to, to have a couple of memes done about me, uh, more with the Great War because it was longer than World War II one. And my favorite one, and we're going to put a picture of it in here, uh, we were at the Tank Museum, Bovington, and David Willey, the director of the Tank Museum there, very eloquent guy, knows his stuff, popular, he's really good camera. We, you know, we were doing interviews and stuff, and somebody got this photo of it, and they put this. <laughs> but, um, and what about, what about the actual song itself, Beyond the Memes? Beyond the Memes was actually the first song written with the Chris, uh, one of the most popular from that album. Uh, really... Nice vibe to it. I don't know what it is. It's really Sabaton. If you listen yeah. to it, you know, it, you don't even have to wait for the sort of the vocals to start. You will know it's a Sabaton song only from. You mean you from know. this part right here? Yes, that's the one I mean. That's the part you mean. Yeah, I think you pretty much got that. <laughs> so, would could you say? I mean, not would you want to say, but could you say if you had to say? Could you pick a single? 10 second thing of a Sabaton song a day, that's us, and that, that defines us. Or yes, is that too much? I can. No, I can, but it's not gonna be this song. It's gonna okay. be Prima Victoria. Okay, well, yeah, okay. Through the gates of hell as we make our way to heaven, through the Nazi lines, and then the choir, Prima Victoria. We can hear that mm -hmm. too. <laughs> See, now you got, man, they get, they get a bonus today. They get all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You kid, you know, we're starting to spoil you guys. Yeah, we're generous guys. You know, it's not too long. It's only a couple months away before this channel will be a year old. Oh yeah, that's right. I know. We started the first episode came out February seventh. Uh, it feels uh, much shorter than that. I can tell you. Yeah, but we've did, we've done dozens of episodes, and we've got dozens more. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll be able to do one of every Sabbath. I would I would like that very much. And if you guys have anything special you'd like to see for our one year anniversary when it comes, we may as well start talking about that now. They're gonna start asking for bloopers. You know that. <laughs> well, I think they're pretty much done talking about the topic at hand, but I just want to say a couple things in closing. First of all, I love that Sabaton does these history videos to kind of give the background behind the songs. Hopefully, if you're anything like me at all, uh, when you start to learn a little bit about a historic subject, you want to learn a lot more about that subject. Uh, so when I hear a song about a subject that I don't know a lot about, I find myself wanting to dig into every detail about what that is. Uh, and so this is one of those. I'll probably spend the next two weeks reading everything I can about the sack of Rome. You know, I know things just from general European history that I've learned over time and from my study, excuse me, specifically of British medieval history, because we're right at the end of the medieval period uh, at this point. But uh, this has been a learning process for me too, and hopefully it is for you as well. Uh, like I say many times, uh, throughout uh, comments on this channel. Nobody knows everything. Even those of us who uh, majored in history in college and have studied it for 30, 40 years don't know nearly everything about history. Uh, so that's why we have an opportunity to learn from each other. So let's continue to do that. Uh, I am planning to make a trip, hopefully to mainland Europe, to uh, do a bunch of videos from places like Normandy, the Argonne Forest, um, Bastogne, uh, and hopefully even maybe Aachen Cathedral in Germany. Uh, and if you uh, want to be able to support this channel, uh, there's a link in the description to the GoFundMe that was set up by our mods on our Discord to help fund that trip uh, that I'm planning to make probably sometime late summer, early fall, assuming travel allows for that. If not, it'll happen as soon as it can. And I'm going to be making tons of videos from those sites, and I'm going to bring it all to you. Uh, so thank you in advance if you're able to help in that way. Please hit like, subscribe if you haven't already. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.